I've been as much a victim of what I call the Patty Hearst syndrome, that Supreme Court reporters are just so in love with their captors and so willing to buy into the narrative that the court is different. The court is just not political. And now I'm sitting here talking to you and I can't quite remember why I felt that way. Hello, welcome to Ezra Klein Show on the Vox Media Podcast Network. Uh, I got back from book leave this week for me. It'll be last week for you. And it's quite a news cycle I walked into. In case you haven't heard, because I don't know why you wouldn't have heard, Anthony Kennedy is retiring. Justice Anthony Kennedy, the, the center of the Supreme Court. It is an earthquake. It means that in less than two years as president, Donald Trump is going to fill two, two, open Supreme Court seats. To put that in perspective, George H.W. Bush filled two seats in four years. Barack Obama filled two in eight years. And I know Barack Obama had three open Supreme Court seats while he was president. But, you know, you're never allowed to fill a Supreme Court seat in an election year, which is, of course, why Republicans are not going to fill the Anthony Kennedy seat this year because 2018 is an election year and they would never fill. Sorry, I'm not even going to. It's too depressing. (laughs) This is the thing about Supreme Court appointments. Because they're lifelong, the results of this are going to reverberate through American history. They're going to reshape American law for generations. And it all – it is so much power and difference to turn on such an unbelievable knife's edge. If 75,000 votes had gone the other way in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, President Hillary Clinton would have named both Scalia and Kennedy's replacements. As it is, Democrats have won the popular vote in six of the last seven presidential elections. But the Supreme Court itself will be dominated by conservatives for decades to come. And so an institution that was built to be insulated from popular accountability, it's becoming extremely undemocratic, but not nonpartisan. Power begets power. The Supreme Court's conservative bloc has used its power to shore up Republican strength in elections and and undermine Democratic strength. From Bush v. Gore to the recent Janus decision weakening public sector unions, from the refusal to touch gerrymandering to the Greenlight Citizens United and its related decisions gave corporations and billionaires to bump all the money they could possibly want into politics, an undemocratic institution is doing quite a bit to undermine democracy. And that's scary. That goes on for long enough you begin to lose your democracy. When I thought about who I wanted to discuss this with, who would have a clear view of all this, the the answer was immediate, Dahlia Lithwick. Slate's legal columnist, the host of the fantastic podcast, Amicus, the the person I go to whenever I need to know something about the Supreme Court, Um, one of the smartest and most humane legal analysts we have. So she's here, and this conversation, (laughs) well, I guess I'm going to let you hear it, Uh, but there's a lot here, and I can't say I'm feeling a lot better. As always, you can email me at EzraKleinShowAdVox.com with feedback, with guest requests, anything. And if you have a moment, if you haven't done it already, take a second, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show. But that said, here is Dahlia Lithwick with a look at where the court has gone and where it's going. Dahlia Lithwick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Ezra. How's your week been? (laughs) What's going on? I think I was just... (laughs) I was just telling the very nice uh, person who's engineering me here at CBC that I have makeup on my face from, I think, three days ago of television and like shellac- sure. shellacked over other layers of like, it's just crazy. It's crazy. Well, I'm really grateful you're, you're here today. I wanted to begin with something that you said on Today Explained that both struck me as the single most clarifying and chilling comment about the aftermath of of Anthony Kennedy resigning, which is that the center of the court, like the swing vote to the extent there is one now, is Justice John Roberts? Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, I think if I could pan back, Ezra, I would also say it's really worth thinking at this moment, not just that the center in my lifetime went, not my lifetime, my journalistic lifetime went from Sandra Day O'Connor, who was legitimately, you know, a country club Republican, but certainly I think we could say a moderate center, to Anthony Kennedy, who was down the line conservative and occasionally voted with the liberals. To John Roberts, who is one of the most 
conservative people who's been seated at the high court in the last hundred years. And that's the center. So I, I just think it parallels, and, and we miss this, the ways in which the entire court has tacked to the right. We still in our head have this idea that it's the Warren court, you know, that we have this court that is reflective of... Uh, some kind of center. And John Paul Stevens always tells the story, and I think it's just a useful place to start, that, you know, he's appointed by a Republican, comes on at the center of the court, leaves the court uh, as probably the far left justice on the court. And when he would be asked, which he would be asked routinely, why did you tack from the right to the left? He would always say, I, I didn't move an inch. The court swung around me. And that what used to be the left wing of the court, the Marshall Brennan wing, disappeared completely. What was the sort of center of the court, which is where Stevens located himself, became the the incredibly radical left of the court. The Rehnquist wing of the court really becomes the center of the court. And then we add John Roberts and Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito and now Neil Gorsuch. And we have a right that he had not seen uh, to that point in his lifetime. And I think it's really important just statistically to know that for the last few decades, every single person who's retired from the court has been replaced by someone either dramatically to their right, like Sandra Day O'Connor being replaced by Sam Alito, or fractionally to their right. And so the court as a whole over the last you know generation has completely become totally different from the court that we think about when we talk about the impeach Earl Warren bumper stickers. And because some of that was imperceptible, Ezra, like I was on a, a radio show yesterday where someone called in and was ranting about the left wing Supreme Court. And I, it's just the left wing Supreme Court is not only gone, but I think the centrist Supreme Court is gone. This is really a conservative court. Has this been true on what we think of as a court's left too? I mean, has the liberal justices appointed to the court, have they been further to the left than their predecessors or, or to their right? Yeah, I think so. I think there's some statistical question around um, maybe Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but I think there's no question that uh, Elena Kagan and Sotomayor is trickier. I'm not sure uh, what we're going to eventually say about Sotomayor. But yes, even on the left wing of the court, we've seen folks who are replaced either by someone awfully close to them uh, or someone uh, slightly to the right of them. And that's partly, you know, I think Barack Obama, that was his pattern on the lower courts, too, was he said in an interview at the Cleveland Plain Dealer before uh, he was elected, he said, Listen, I'm a huge fan of the Brennans and the Marshalls, but there is no place for them in my view of the court. You know, elections matter. Ezra, you know this better than anyone. Courts are not uh, the locus of change, and I'm not putting people like that on the court. And so even when folks would say to him, tit for tat, answer an Alito with, a, you know, left Alito, put a Pam Carlin on the court, put somebody who is as far to the left as uh, Neil Gorsuch has proven to be to the right. Obama wanted nothing to do with that. And that's true, by the way, of his lower court appointments as well. What is the story you tell for why the right-wing members have become so much more right-wing? Is that simply the Republican Party getting better at selecting people, developing more of a, a farm team? Is that a, an ideological story? What 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 is the explanation? I, I think that there's two parts of the origin story. I think one is Bork happened. And I think that that was seen as an original sin, that failing to this get— This is Judge Bork who was um, rejected from his nomination. Right. Yeah. Judge Bork, who doesn't make it to the court, who's seen, whose seat eventually becomes Anthony Kennedy's seat. Look, Borking became a verb after that. And I think that there was always a feeling that that seat was stolen. And when you think about how much rage was directed at Kennedy in the last few decades, uh, you know, he defects on gay marriage, he defects on— on abortion, he defects on affirmative action. That's because that was meant to be Robert Bork's seat. And when I think liberals say things like, you know, that seat was stolen, uh, the Merrick Garland seat was stolen, the response is, hey, you stole Bork's seat. So 
part of the reason I think Kennedy was such a disappointment in some sense is because they felt as though Bork was treated unfairly. But I think maybe more pointedly, Ezra, there is a rallying cry on the movement conservative thinking about this that is no more David Souters. Uh, They really do. I think they might have little rubber bracelets that say no more David Souters. And the idea that you could put someone up, that a Republican president has the opportunity to put someone up who is a rock-ribbed, Bork-like Republican, and they put up someone who not only drifts left, but in their view, drifts to the rabid left, that could never be allowed to happen again. And you don't have the analog on the left. Nobody says no more Stephen Breyers, right? Stephen Breyer is without a doubt a a center-left Democratic uh, appointee, but nobody on the left says, oh, my God, you know, Breyer has failed us time and time again. Uh, So there just isn't that intensity around the proposition that we will not allow anyone on the court who even intimates that they're in play or that they're going to modulate over time. And I think that's actually the answer for why Harriet Myers got taken out. That wasn't She wasn't taken out by the left saying we don't know anything about her. That was very much in the mindset of no more David Souters. We cannot have anyone on the court that isn't an utterly predictable down the line conservative. And there's no such focus and um, sort of single minded view of what a liberal judge is that exists on the left. I, I think about this attitude sometimes, and, and I, I'd be lying if I didn't say in, in a way I was sympathetic to it. There seems to me to be a mythology around the court and, and around legal analysis generally that is somehow divorced from politics, divorced from power, that it's these gigantic brains who exist up in the clouds just thinking through their way through first principles and, and legal reasoning and constitutional interpretation. And I know the court deals with many technical cases and cases that are really just cases of law. But it seems to me that for a long time when it deals with political cases, that the reasoning ends up being quite political, that certainly at that level, people are very good arguers and debaters and thinkers, and and they end up justifying oftentimes the things they want to justify. And so the politicization of of nominations or when you nominate somebody to have this much power for the rest of their life, which is another thing I want to get to later, the fact that political parties and, and particularly on the right are now incredibly intent on making sure that the person they put there will wield that power in a way they like. In a way, it seems to me to do violence to our idea of the court, but it it seems to me the inevitable result of having something like a Supreme Court that has to deal with highly politicized issues and that has a a politicized nomination process. I'm curious if you have reflections on this, if this is just – if this is really something that's gone awry or if this is how the system always had to end up. You know, it's interesting. I think uh, Ian Milheiser's book about the court was a good reminder for me that the court has always been a small C conservative institution and that we romanticize the Warren court at our peril and that time, time, time again, uh, faced with the opportunity to be progressive and to defend progressive values and to do, if you think that the core function of the court is to be a kind of counter-majoritarian check on the other branches and to speak for the powerless, unerringly almost throughout history, the court has failed to do that. Uh, and, And so we make the mistake of thinking that the court institutionally is on the side of the little guy or on the side of democracy. So so that's part of it. I think that by design and I and I partly that's my answer when people say but Mueller will save us. Uh, up until a week ago people were saying but Kennedy will save us. What is baked in to the American magical thinking around the rule of law and the courts is that the courts really do uh, sort of fly in on silver unicorns and promote, you know, justice and democracy. And I think if we learned anything from Anthony Kennedy, it's that the courts are not always <laughs> equipped to do that kind of thing. So, so, so part of it is I just think the framers gave us the gift, but also I think the curse of thinking that the rule of law 
uh, was this self-reinforcing proposition that was going to uh, withstand any battery and come out and just fix things. So, so, so that's part of my answer. But I think to be more responsive, I, I think that the Republicans very wisely about, you know, and this goes back to the Mies revolution on the courts, um, made the decision that if they couldn't win elections and they couldn't effectuate policy ends, through the elected branches, they would do it through the courts. And so I think that what you got was not only, you know, the birth of a conservative legal movement that absolutely clobbers whatever the legal liberal movement is, but it's just so organized and it has been for decades. And it that plays out, you know, in the most nuclear level, you know, the existence of the Federalist Society, the pipeline that is Federalist Society, law school, grooming people, clerkships, making sure that all of those folks know the right people, they clerk on the right courts, um, they get on these short lists. I mean, this is all really by design, such an efficient machinery that doesn't have a parallel on the left. It just doesn't. And part of the explanation for why it took Barack Obama when he first got elected such a long time, even to start to put people on the courts, even to start to fight for judges, which, by the way, he didn't always fight for his judges, is just because the machinery doesn't exist. And so I think if you have that asymmetry in enthusiasm around the court, and it maps perfectly onto the asymmetry in messaging around the court, which is really what Donald Trump ran and won on more than anything was when he would say to those stadiums full of people, I don't care if you freaking hate me, you're going to vote for me anyway, because the court, no parallel on the left. And all the exit polls the night after the 2016 election showed that for the 20 percent or so of the electorate who prioritized the courts, two to one, they break for Donald Trump. It's so deep. It's not just that it's, you know, sort of baked into the courts and the system, but this is a decades long project to prioritize the court, to pr- prioritize messaging around the court. The the John Roberts, you know, liberals are all activists. We are neutral we call balls and strikes, all that is of a piece with this massive project that has just been absolutely successful at convincing Americans that we need conservatives on the court because they do law. Liberals are a bunch of pot-smoking hippies who make stuff up and do interpretive dance. And that is just such a message that has absolutely permeated the doctrine and the discourse that it none of it surprised me. The asymmetry you're describing has been by design uh, the unitary project. Now we're just seeing it come to, I think, fruition. For decades, credit cards have been telling us to buy it now and pay for it later and pay for it with interest. Despite your best intentions, that interest can get out of control fast. With Lending Club, you can consolidate your debt or pay off credit cards with one fixed monthly payment. Since 2007, Lending Club has helped millions of people regain control of their finances with affordable fixed rate personal loans. There are no trips to a bank, no high interest credit cards. You just go to LendingClub.com, you tell them about yourself, how much you want to borrow, you pick the terms that are right for you, and if you're approved, your loan is automatically deposited into your bank account in as little as a few days. Lending Club is the number one peer-to-peer lending platform with over $35 billion in loans issued. So go to LendingClub.com slash EZRA. You can check your rate in minutes and borrow up to $40,000. That is LendingClub.com slash EZRA. Again, LendingClub.com slash EZRA. All loans here are made by WebBank, a member of the FDIC, and an equal housing lender. There's a way in which it all turned, though, on such an amazing knife's edge. I think a lot about the Merrick Garland case. And I have, I think, somewhat unusual opinions about it uh, for someone with my political views, which is I look at what happened there and I think that Mitch McConnell did something that was both unbelievably unprincipled and did real violence to the way our system is supposed to work and set in place a principle that he never had any intention of following and, of course, is not following now as he prepares to replace Anthony Kennedy in an election year and also that 
given the stakes of the court and for the people who elected Mitch McConnell and his Senate majority, and by the way, those people to some degree were Democrats who sat out the 2014 election, which had the lowest turnout in 72 years because people couldn't think of anything that might change. Um, meanwhile, we had a 5-4 court with a bunch of people over 80 on it. And then in addition to holding the Garland seat open, he creates this issue that helps unite conservatives around Trump. And the fact that 75,000 votes then in the end in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania end up deciding two different seats on the Supreme Court and a generation of law. It, it, it feels to me – well, there are two things here. One is it feels to me like evidence that the stakes of this are too high for our system, though the way we're doing it now does not make a ton of sense. But two, that – to have four of nine justices nominated by losers of the popular vote in the election, the court is not supposed to be a highly small-D democratic institution, but it's becoming more and more undemocratic as our political geography and coalitions change in ways that uh, that push towards that, in ways that make me worry for its long-term legitimacy. Maybe I'll ask – rather than ask you to respond to both, I'll, I'll start on the first one. That there's something about the stakes of this when you have these lifetime appointments that it, it, it seems it seems too big now for a country this polarized. That, that the long-term effect of having a court too out of step with popular opinion, this doesn't seem stable to me. I, I think that's right. I mean, I, let's let's stop and recall that when the framers <laughs> thought about lifetime tenure, they were thinking about 50 and 60 year olds whose life expectancy was 65. <laughs> you know, they weren't looking at what Donald Trump, you know, the, the youngest person on this list of 25 shortlisters is 37. So when Donald Trump says 40 years, it could be 60 years. Uh, that certainly, I think, wasn't in the cards. And I think it's also true. I mean, look, we are now for the first time looking at a court where every single liberal was appointed by a Democrat, every single uh, conservative was appointed by a Republican. As we started the show, there is no centrist at the court. So the court has mirrored the polarization that you're describing. And that wasn't the intent. And it wasn't the intent, even if you think about the oddity of, hey, let's just throw Robert Jackson on the court and see what happens. Let's throw, you know, Hugo Black on. I mean, there was such a, a, a different view of the court. It wasn't that the presidents didn't care, but I think that there was this kind of consensus that, hey, you know, we'll put this rando up and see what happens and, you know, shuffle things around a little. And by the way, and Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg both talked about the fact that uh, they were confirmed by 90-something margins. So even that has changed. You know, nobody said, I can't vote for Antonin Scalia. They knew exactly what he was and still confirmed him because there was a view that a justice is a justice, and as long as they're fit, we confirm them. And that's vaporized, too. So every single part of the process, from the president who selects them to the senators who confirm them, have changed from kind of a low-stakes enterprise to what you're describing, which is this is a battle to the death, and we are going to treat it as such. And I think, Ezra, maybe my answer is... Historically, even if we were winking when we said it, we believed that the court was different, that it wasn't a purely political body, that some other thing was going on in there. And that is really, I think, what has fallen away, that whatever mythology that existed around the idea that the court wasn't pure power and uh, pure winners and losers is gone. And it's funny because the, the most vociferous proponent of that idea used to be Anthony Kennedy. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think it's just the polarization that has happened in the media and in the country and in the Congress has dragged the court along with it. And I think I can't see a way in which the court could return to being something that has a clump of moderates who are going back and forth. And so I think if you're asking, did we maybe break the court or break the notion that the court does anything other than pure power, I, I think we, we may have. 
So I, I love the way you put that because I think it, it connects to such other big things in our, our politics. I always have this argument with people when we talk about how politically polarized we're getting. It is true that something really has changed. In fact, I think people underestimate how much has changed. Being a Republican or being a Democrat in 1965 or 1975 did not encode nearly as much ideological information as it does now. You had liberal Republicans. You had conservative Democrats. I mean there was stuff that was all over the map and now you really don't. Now being a Republican or Democrat just means something very precise about your ideology. And so I always hear people when they think about this or they look at this try to look for ways – to have a less polarized country, right? If polarization is a problem, then clearly less polarization is the answer. But if you if you believe, as I do, that polarization is a is a one way ratchet, that we're just going to be keep going in that direction for all kinds of reasons that that we can talk about if you want, well, then the question becomes: Well, how do you polarization proof, or at least um, build your institutions or design them so that they can function amidst polarization. And, and that to me feels like the question that we need to ask on the court. I always thought – I was not a huge fan of Rick Perry's 2012 presidential campaign, but his idea that we should have a one-time 18-year non-renewable term for Supreme Court justices so then every single president gets two openings in a, in a consistent way um, during their tenure – that made a lot of sense to me just to bring down the stakes of this so that over time in a polarized country where we know that the court is going to reflect our politics a little bit more, at least it's not completely random. At least you don't have people playing power politics the way you did with Garland. At least you at least you would have a little bit more. There, there would be an ability to plan and for the system to absorb it. Maybe you want to create different rules around it. Um, there, there are all kinds of things you can do. But I feel like our problem in part is that we exist in this polarized world, which is true in our in our judicial nominations as well as it is in anything else, but we refuse to make any changes to accept it. And so the stakes keep going higher because lifetimes are getting longer, because people are getting more polarized, because the legal system is getting more polarized, and we just keep hoping something happens that will make this feel better. But actually, like we have to make some changes. And so I'm I'm curious if you think there is a different way the nomination process, the the tenure process, if there's any different way that you think the court needs to be reformed or the way we name people the court needs to be reformed to make more sense in this era. Yeah, it's a hard question because I feel like in my almost two decades of covering the court, I've been as much a victim of what I call the Patty Hearst syndrome, that Supreme Court reporters are just so in love with their captors and so willing to buy into the narrative that the court is different. The court is just not political. And if you had asked me two years ago, I was still maintaining that I oppose term limits because I think that the framers really thought that lifetime tenure provided an incredibly important countermajoritarian check. Uh, and now I'm sitting here talking to you and I can't quite remember why I felt that way um, or why I should continue to feel that way. So I think that one of the paradoxes that I always noticed in the Supreme Court press corps uh, was we do believe this fiction that the court is completely apolitical, except that we don't because we are careful to say appointed by a Republican. So we we live on the seam of the two realities you're describing that we really do believe in order to do our jobs that what the court does is different from raw politics. And yet we're not stupid. <laughs> we were there for Bush v. Gore. Uh, we know how this shakes out. And so I think what is happening in this conversation as I'm talking to you is I'm realizing, you know, what is going to pierce that for me? At what point do I throw up my hands and say, OK, let's do away with lifetime tenure because this whole thing is pointless, in which case I should just be a White House correspondent, right? I mean, I think that there there really is a lot. One of us. One <laughs> of us. <laughs> I'd be so bad at it. I would just be sitting there. <laughs> we like, don't want to be a real white. Like, oh, that's too much right now. Eating Snickers bars and crying. No, I, I think, I mean, I think you know, your question is really hard. And I think that uh, for those of us who really believe that the court is different, it's intolerable to accept any kind of structural fix. At the same time, you know, I've been the person who has long said 
Confirmation hearings are a disaster. Uh, the week-long televised Klieg lights insanity of confirmation hearings is only serving to polarize. And certainly we're about to see that again in September. So I think that there are ways in which the national conversation around the courts has become very, very cartoonish and silly and is contributing uh, to all the problems you're describing. In a perfect world, I guess my answer is, and I, I guess I would turn this back to you, so much of what we are not reckoning with, even in this conversation, even I would say we are not going to reckon with it going forward into the confirmation hearing that is going to happen presumably in September, is the ways that religion is confounding this. And and I think, you know, we have certainly, I think it's fair to say, uh, uh, a, a president who is uh, narrow casting to religious voters about one issue, and that is Roe. Uh, and I think that that has really, I, I mean, I guess I'm just curious about how you think that the ways in which conversations about faith and religion in this country inflect upon conversations around the court and the almost complete inability to talk about that realistically, I think, does as much damage to our fanciful ideas about what the court should be doing uh, as any of the structural problems you're describing? Oh, that's such a good question. All right. I want to ask one other question <laughs> on, on the previous, and then I will come back to religion. <laughs> we will talk religion. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you just said something that I think is so, it's so important. You, you, you're talking about the founders and that they saw lifetime tenure as an important counter-majoritarian check. And this brings up for me something that is really problematic when we talk about the founders because we have all these words where we think we know what they mean with them. And I, I, and I, I think you and I think you do know what the, will know what they mean. But I, I think we use them wrong now. So the founders, because I've been doing a lot of this work for my book, for one thing, they didn't believe we would have political parties when they wrote the Constitution. Mm -hmm. They thought political parties were terrible and we weren't going to have them and there'd be no parties and no organization in that way because factions make everybody act crazy, which is true. Of course, they then started a bunch of political parties. But so I think we here in our sort of normal day-to-day -day political lives, because we think of political majorities as meaning – you know, the Democratic Party is in power, so the Republican Party is a minority. So counter-majoritarian means that it's reasonable to have a Republican conservative check on the court when you have a, an ongoing sort of Democratic majority in Congress and the presidency. I think that is the way people's minds interpret that. But when we're defending something like lifetime tenure based on what the founders intended, that's not what they wanted. They were just concerned about mob rule. They were just – they did not really like people that much a lot of the time. <laughs> they were very concerned about what would happen if the, if the passions of the public got out of control. And, and when they meant counter-majoritarian, they meant really smart white men who would be – you know pulled back from what was happening in the populace and, and would be able to make sort of decisions that, 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 that were not as inflected with all of that. I, I just think there's a way in which we justify – we've taken things they believed and then translated that into our current language without recognizing how different the reference are in our current language. And so, I mean, I don't know how they would look at the system we have today, but the idea that you have a, a court where counter-majoritarian just means – Perhaps because of the ways a couple elections and also because of the ways of electoral college and because of the ways that just chance and death worked out, you end up having a court dominated by a minority political party for a very long time. That isn't that isn't what they meant by that, but that's what we have now um, or, or could be what we have if demographics go the way many people think they will. Now, maybe you want that, right? I think you could actually make an argument for why that would be a good idea. But I just I, – I think that we – we assume that's what counter-majoritarian desire to do, but it, but it, but it really wasn't. And given how much has changed, I just think it's strange when we go back and say, "Well, they intended this," but I don't know. They didn't. They didn't intend any of. I mean, they didn't intend. It's very hard to talk about intent in a world where it would be so hard for them to be able to look at it and and understand all that had happened. It's so funny, Ezra, because I, when I talk about counter-majoritarian, I actually don't think in terms of parties, which just tells right, you— Right. That's what I say. I don't think yeah, you do this. No, I, I, I really think about, you know, Brown v. Board. I think about Obergefell. I think about powerless— constituencies or relatively powerless constituencies and 
constitutional rights. Uh, and so it's funny. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, the valence, of course, that you're putting is actually correct. But when I cringe at the idea of uh, cabining Article Three power, it's it's because I really have seen, for instance, in state Supreme Courts that elect their justices, how corrosive, you know, the, the sort of multi-million dollar ads are and the pledges to, you know, put everyone behind bar. I mean, the folks who have no constituencies are the ones who get screwed when Supreme Court justices have to promise that everyone's going to jail forever. So I really do think that sort of the hallmark of what I think of as counter-majoritarian really is what we saw in the ACLU case earlier this week, you know, a judge saying, I don't care who's in power or what's going on, like kids at the border can't get ripped away from their parents. And given that there's no constituency, I guess I'm just going to certify a class and issue an injunction. And I think that judges, you know, that's why we have Article Three lifetime tenure, because someone's going to try to impeach that guy. And so I think it's it's it's. In a, in a perfect world, it really has no party or political valence. It just has to do with who's looking out for the folks who don't have power. And I realize that's so idealistic and naive. Uh, but I do think that's something that I might still fight to protect, even when, as you point out, and I think this is just a coda to something you said about the asymmetry. I mean, I think one of the things that we're not talking about when we talk about this term isn't just that we have, you know, the most pro-business court we've seen in forever, the most pro-Trump court that we could have imagined. But also, if you think about what went through the wood chipper this year was voting rights. And if you aggregate, you know, the the, the Gill uh, and Benesek cases that didn't answer the partisan gerrymander case. And then you look at uh, the Ohio voter purge case, Houston. And then you look at this week's Texas racial gerrymander case. This was the worst year I can remember for voting rights. And what that means is that folks who are going to go to the polls in 2020 and, you know, 2022 and going forward will have even less political power than they had. And so it's it's there's a weird meta sense in which this kind of conservative five justice block is actually distorting uh, electoral politics to make it even harder uh, to be represented. And I think that that is one of the stories we, we've kind of failed to tell coming out of this term, that this isn't just kind of a quote unquote uh, conservative court because Christian cake bakers and because, you know, abortion, but also because the vote is literally being diluted in front of our noses. And that will affect everything going forward. And we're not talking about that either. Yeah. The, and I know we need to get back to religion, but th this this right here, this has been my obsession. This is a thing more than anything that I want to talk to you about today that, you know, you can go back to Bush v. Gore with it. But but if you're just, as you say, you gave a, a great rundown of, of this year. So you have an, a very, again, small d here, small d undemocratic institution where the composition of it is only what it is and is only what it's going to be because, among other things, a Senate majority that had a minority of the votes, right, the 55-45 the um, Republican majority actually did not have a majority of votes. It had a minority of votes. Um, Barack Obama, who did win with a majority of votes, uh, was not allowed by that by that majority to name someone. Um, <laughs> then it was held up. Then the loser of the popular vote came in. So you have a very a, a court that is itself not reflective of politicians who won the popular vote. And then – they are making a series of decisions, uh, the, the the ones you just named and others. And, and I would actually put Janice in that category mm -hmm, where they're weakening mm -hmm. a core yep. pillar of the, of the Democratic coalition. They're making a series of decisions that help strengthen um, their co-partisans' electoral fortunes and weaken the opposing party's uh, electoral fortunes. And, and you said there's a, a meta way in which they're, they're affecting uh, elections, but I would say it's not meta at all. <laughs> I would say it's a very – like it is a – like a – like an alley oop. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Like it is a very direct play, which, again, if we saw this in another country, I sometimes like try to impose this discipline on myself of what would I say about this if somebody told me it was happening in Brazil, if somebody told me it was happening in Finland, if somebody told me it was happening somewhere else. 
And, you know, you say, OK, there's a political party. It's begun losing the popular vote in a lot of elections, but still winning the election because of its geographic distribution. It feels itself under threat by changing demographics and it's becoming more insular as that happens. And then it's naming people to different positions. And once in those positions, those people are resetting the rules such that that party can retain its hold on power for longer. I wouldn't like sit around scratching my head. That, that's a very straightforward story. I feel like people don't want to tell it about our country because it, it, it's a bad story. We don't like that story. It's a it's a story that speaks of a, 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 a of a decline in the quality and construction of our democracy. But it does seem to me to be the story we are watching go forward and that we are probably going to see accelerate. I mean, I look at things like what happened in North Carolina. Um, you know, with the you know, unbelievable power grab there after the election, as foretelling a, a future, as as parties see their hold on power slipping, you know, sometimes they give it up peacefully, sometimes they don't give it up peacefully. But there's also this middle round where sometimes they try to keep from giving it up operationally. And when you have a lot of institutions that are rule setting in this way, but are are, are run by political actors, you can do a lot with those institutions to to make the game a little bit easier for your side, and then your side can keep putting people in those positions, and, and on and on the cycle goes. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been trying to think out, Ezra, my big end-of-term piece, and I haven't quite got there yet, but I think some version of what you just said is informing my thinking, which is how did the court in all its grandeur end the term so small? And the court seems to have, in, in this last few days— infinite solicitude for what the one Christian cake baker, because somebody on the Colorado Civil Rights Commission said something true that may have somehow had some layer of anti-religious animus, you know, that that crisis pregnancy centers, which literally hold themselves out as anti-abortion institutions, can't put up signs that truthfully reflect uh, the limits of the services they provide because it's, in Clarence Thomas's view, it's coercing uh, speech from these good faith religious actors. And it, it's there's a way in which there is the centering of certain people as victims uh, and the complete blindness, you know, all of these refugees at the border and asylum seekers and travelers uh, uh, from Muslim majority countries that just fall away. And there's just almost a way in which who these five justices chose to center, uh, whose dignitary interests were centered uh, at the end of this term. It just seems as though the aperture is really, really tiny right now. And maybe the the kind of most emblematic version of that is this amazing concurrence that Justice Anthony Kennedy uh, puts up in the travel ban case where he sort of signs off with John Roberts, like, whoops, you know, what can we do? Uh, we, we're not going to take into account any of the things that Donald Trump said about Muslims uh, in enacting the first, second, or third travel ban. And then Justice Kennedy adds this very odd PS that is just like, eh, what can the courts do about it? Best of luck. Try to be good folks. Be kind to each other out there. I'm out. And it's weird because there is this sense in which institutionally it's, 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 not realizing that by sidelining itself in this moment, in this way, all of those interests that you're describing of you know, what a constitutional democracy is meant to be fighting for uh, sort of disappear and we're, we're on the head of a pin fighting about the signs posted in crisis pregnancy centers. It just feels small. As usual, your stomach and the rest of your life are at war. You need to eat, but you can't stop what you're doing to actually get what you want to eat. And the only fast things to deliver are not what you want. They're not delicious. They're not healthy. So introducing Postmates, the app that adds a delivery option to your favorite restaurants, even the ones that don't deliver. Imagine anything you want to eat at your door whenever you need it. You don't have to drive. You don't have to park. You don't even have to talk on the phone to order because <laughs> talking on the phone. You just download the app and you get what you want. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, Postmates will bring you what you want within the hour. You can even see where your food is and track your driver. And hey, you forgot to pick something up from the grocery? No problem. They can get that. Craving a tasty veggie burger? <laughs> Check. Looking for the perfect bottle of red wine or a summer beer? Order up. Postmates is your new long-term munchies booty call. 
For a limited time, Postmates is giving you $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days. To start your free deliveries, download the app today and use the code EZRA100. That is Ezra100. <laughs> Again, that is code EZRA100 for $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days. Save the hassle, get the food you love fast at Postmates. Code EZRA100. Let me offer a different interpretation of this, and, and and this speaks to some of the stuff I'm thinking about in my book and, and just sort of beginning – I'm working on a big essay about a related topic here too. A couple things are happening in the country right now that, that strike me as the essential backdrop for most of the political fights and, and political currents we're seeing. So we are having a stunning rise in the non-white share of, of, of Americans. So in 2013, it was the first year ever um, a majority of infants were non-white by – 2045, roughly, we're going to be a majority minority nation racially. I mean, there was this New York Times piece based on some new census data just last week saying that in a majority of states, white deaths now outnumber white births. So we're having this very, very fast and, and profound change in our racial composition. We are um, nearing, uh, and in the next 15, 20 years, we'll, we'll, if statistics hold, we'll get to a record number of foreign-born residents uh, in this country. The, the last time we were this high was uh, the 1920s, I believe it was, and then we were we were only at about four percent in the 1970s. Now we're back up to around 14 percent. So there's a, a huge rise in foreign-born residents, and um, religious uh, the white Christian America uh, is beginning to decline as well. Um, we're seeing a very sharp rise in religiously non-affiliated um, Protestants are, are are starting to go down. And again, you know, the the demographers say somewhere around the 2040s, um, religiously non-affiliated is likely going to pass. Protestant as the the single biggest category. And so within that, when you say who becomes the victims, right? Who is the court seeing as the victims? Who does the court see itself as protecting? When you begin to stack these rulings one on top of the other, I think they speak to a court, much like Donald Trump speaks to a country, that sees the traditional white majority Christian majority of America as under threat. And it's beginning to weaken voting rights acts and it is uh folks who are religious and saying, you know, they're actually under threat now from a secular majority that is trying to make them do things they don't want to do. And it looks at the people coming in over the border or coming here for asylum and it says, oh, you know, they 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 probably actually have too many rights. We're going to let the the government treat them more cruelly and 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 strengthen our ability to keep people out of this country. And to me, it's a very big idea. It's Donald Trump's big idea that actually the people who are being persecuted, the people who are victimized, the people who now need protection in this country are the people we used to think of as a majority and, and people who now feel that majority status, that power slipping away from them. And I'm not saying it's as explicit as all that, but I think a lot of things in politics are – they 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 operate subtly and through currents and, and, and through context. And I, I do think that compared to other periods in, in the court when clearly the, who the court has seen as victims are some of these groups that I'm talking about is now being at least numerically on the rise. I think that the court is being appointed by people and, and driven by people and, 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 and the folks in power in politics right now, they are very clearly concerned about a, um, a rising generation that, that feels somewhat threatening to them. And I feel like both the laws and decisions we're seeing – reflect that. And it, it doesn't feel – that that feels very big to me actually if that continues to become the case because to me when I look forward to the next 20, 30, 40 years of politics, as these numbers be, continue to change, I mean the the size of the political fights here I think are going to be quite profound and and it does feel to me like this court is, is, an, is reflecting that in an early way much the way Trump is reflecting that more explicitly in an early way. Does that sound does that sound crazy to you? Do am I do I sound like a ranting lunatic, or does that does that make some sense? No, I think I mean I think what you're describing is actually, um, you know, when I talk about smallness, I, I don't mean to imply that the effects are small. I think the effects are as vast as you've just described. I think it's just, um, you know, a scope of vision that I'm trying to characterize as small. But you know, I think what you're saying dovetails so. Interestingly, with this change in, you know, Sonia Sotomayor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg this year become the radical lefties on the court. You know, we've got Elena Kagan and Steve Breyer time and again uh, trying to find some center at the court, making common cause, uh, sometimes with Anthony Kennedy, sometimes with the chief. And Sotomayor and Ginsburg peeling off, you know, time, time, time again, some of the most extraordinary uh, dissents of the term are given to Sotomayor to write. And I think it's interesting what 
you're saying, because it almost feels as though she has taken on the job of saying, look at what I see. <laughs> look at the America that I see. Look at the, you know, uh, immigrants in the cases that I see. Look at what it's like to have brown skin and be stopped uh, by the cops. And, and, and it's not that that's new. That's been, I think, her role at the court. But it is interesting uh, in light of what you're saying that you almost feel as though there's this kind of, you know, Will Ferrell, like, am I losing my mind here quality where she's like, why can't you see all these people that Ezra just cited to and the ways in which they make up this country? And that it often feels as though she's kind of alone on a mountaintop making that point over and over again. So I, I, I don't disagree uh, with anything you just said. And I, and I also think, you know, it's very one of the things that's so fascinating to me, I, I think, all the time about the role of gender and these justices. And I think that there's a way in which the one thing that she and Justice Ginsburg and Justice Kagan bring to the court is what it is like to be an insider and an outsider at the same time. You know, they've just never been uh, privileged white men who get to blinker themselves uh, to the America you just described. And so I think there is a way in which, you know, I've never been comfortable essentializing about the women justices, but I do see this term a way in which uh, what she's doing maps onto what you're saying, which is the world is, you know, much bigger than the world in which Donald Trump's kids work with Anthony Kennedy's kids. And so end of story, you know, we're all good people. It's it's a really interesting moment. And now, Ezra, I would like you to answer my religion question. Go. So we, we, we <laughs> reframe the question for me. I just want to make sure I answer it correctly. Um, I think I probably said it better the first time, but what I think you, I think, how did this go? You were asking me how we could do better to depolarize and depoliticize the conversation around the court. And I think what I am seeing in these kind of identity questions around the court is there's a very lopsided conversation around religion in the court, and it is incredibly effective. And that if you are a voter for whom the only thing that matters is overturning Obergefell or Roe, uh, there is a lot to say about what Donald Trump's next nominee is going to do and to be. And yet I, I have been really struck almost dumb by the inability to say it. I think if I had to make it specific, I would say, you know, remember Amy Coney Barrett, uh, she is the Donald Trump pick for the Seventh Circuit. Diane Feinstein tried to question her about her own faith and the role of her faith in judging. Uh, Judge Barrett had written quite extensively about the intersection of her own faith and judging. And the left went crazy on Diane Feinstein for even having the temerity uh, to propose a religious test for the court. So the, I, the left did or the right did? Both. Well, the right without question. But but the academic left the said, left this isn't an inappropriate conversation. How dare you? So I think that what I I am trying to press on is how the left talks about the connection between Donald Trump and religion and Roe and the court. Uh, and I think that I'm pressing on the fact that the left chooses not to talk about it at all. Yeah, I, th I think that's correct. I mean, I, I think a couple things here. One is that I think the religious right or, or, or the religious community. I, I want to be careful because obviously there are a lot of different religions, but mm -hmm. but in this case, I think we're talking about a, a sort of Christian religious right. I think it has an experience of a real trauma before the court and that that is its foundational political activation story. Mm -hmm. And one reason the left doesn't know what to do with it is it doesn't have that same trauma. You're, you're not activated by things you gain in the way people are by things you lose. I would not be surprised if Kennedy's replacement leads to an overturning of Roe. Mm -hmm. I think you might see something similar emerge on the left. Um, I, I think that – I think the experience of loss in politics is the single most activating experience that exists and it can it can linger for, for generations. But there's something else I think in what you said that, that I, I do note and I think is very powerful, which is that – the way a lot of religious people feel um, and, and, and the way their cases in front of the court and their rhetoric and politics begin to change is, is notable here and intersects with different, with different tributaries from the court's longtime rhetoric and idea of itself as a protector of minorities. So 
I have been struck in the past couple of years by how much folks who are Christian and conservative feel themselves to be an embattled minority. I mean, there's a version of this where you see like Rod Dreher's book about the Benedict Option and and, and his argument that the Christians exist in such a secularized world, the only thing they can do is is, is pull back into cloistered, um, much purer communities. I think you see it in discussions about religious protections that, you know, if you read Russ Douthat's columns on this, you'll see a lot of talk about Look, Christians are losing a lot of these fights, are losing fights on gay marriage, are losing fights on abortion, they're losing fights on um, you know, what you can and can't do under the law, and that as the secular side wins these fights, it needs to treat the losers with with, with grace and with some generosity to keep there from being a, a big backlash. But what's funny about all this happening is that we're not really yet at a point where that group has lost power. It still has quite a lot of power. It has power in the Trump administration. It has power over the party that controls both the House and the Senate. It has power on the court. And so there's an, an interesting moment of intersection here where a group that because it is beginning to lose some very big battles and is beginning to see demographics move against it and is beginning to feel loss, it's beginning to feel itself very quickly as an embattled minority and very much felt itself that way amidst both like the political and cultural coalitions of the Obama era. But they've not actually lost that much power. And so they still have quite a lot of power. And so they're going both as an embattled, persecuted minority in front of powerful tribunes that reflect them in their opinions. Mm -hmm. And the union of that can be very powerful. Um, just yesterday, actually, it'll come out in a few weeks. I, I had an interview with a, a tech guy named Jaron Lanier. He makes this great point where he says when, when, when the powerful act like they're powerless, and he's talking here about Silicon Valley, very bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. And I do think we're in one of these moments of, of, of shakiness there where there's just confusion about who holds power, who wields power, who needs protection, who doesn't need protection. But for a sympathetic group to come before this court and say, we need protection, and the court is actually very largely of that group and wants to help them out, that creates a very powerful union of the Supreme Court, which I'm not sure there is anything for the left to say about it. And this might get to the question of what Democrats can or can't do with the Kennedy replacement. But a lot of this just comes down to power to me. And um, right now on the court and, and in politics, the coalition that is power is not the left. Hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And I also think here's my the mystical <laughs> gloss I would add is that I, I often think, you know, for a secular country, the United States is the most religious country in the world. And the foundational text is the Constitution and the, you know, the church, the temple is the high court. And, you know, maybe it it maps onto what I was saying at the beginning of, about the magical thinking around the court and the Constitution and the judiciary. Uh, but I think that there is something quite religious about the ways uh, most of us think about the court and the Constitution. And that can be very, very complicated when applied to the court in ways that uh, fall away when you're talking about just politics. But maybe that's even too goofy for me. I don't know. I, I think there's, there's certainly something about the ways in which we create a kind of... We have... I mean, I think a lot of countries probably do, but but deep mythologies around our public institutions. I don't want to call them spiritual exactly, but they're heroic, they're mm -hmm. narrative, <laughs> they're – and I think that, that that's true – that there's nowhere that is as true as the Supreme Court um, in, in American political institutions, right? There's no, there's no institution that we narrativize as much because mm -hmm. I think we understand it as little and we have as little access to it. It's it sort of distance makes it easier to paint this onto it. And so we sort of learn about it in these moments where it descends down. And I mean, like, just like all the pomp, at, like the people wear robes, it's all very yep. priestly. If yep. you look at it, no, it has it a totally... very, has the aesthetics of religion, actually. It totally does. And I think that, you know, when I, we started this conversation, I told you about our crazy Patty Hearst syndrome at the press corps. I think that's a big part of it. I mean, I think there is, you know, Supreme Court reporters, I think the idea that you could question you know, the justices, the way political reporters uh, question politicians. I mean, I think we'd rather gouge our own kidneys out than, you know, be that disrespectful. And I don't think it's, uh, you know, that they inherently have that much more power over us. I think it goes back to something I was saying about we really believe, we believe that what they are doing uh, is different and it's fragile. And I think, uh, you know, when Donald Trump goes after an independent judiciary or goes after individual Article Three judges, one of the things that is shocking to those of us who cover the courts is that nobody ever talks this way because we really believe that judges are, 
you, you can say it's a religion or you can say it's magic or you can say, I don't know how else to characterize it, but this is a, a bridge too far. And I think that, you know, part of what is interesting is as that collapses, right, and Donald Trump is like, eh, immigration judges, they're just a bunch of hookers. Um, you know, we, we're so gobsmacked, we don't even <laughs> know what, what just happened. I think maybe that's a good segue into the question about given that we have nominees who will not tell us what they think and we have the theater of a confirmation <laughs> hearing in which nothing is going to happen. Uh, is there anything that uh, Senate Democrats can do? They're going to have a hearing presumably in September where uh, they get to do something, Ezra, that messages something about what justice is and what courts do and what they would like a judge to be. What would be the answer to that? I mean, I, I guess I start with the precatory caution that I think it can't only be judges preserve Roe v. Wade. So I have a few thoughts here now that's been turned on me. Uh, <laughs> one is that it depends who's nominated. If the person nominated seems to the public like a reasonable, um, qualified human, <laughs> I think Democrats' power here is extremely limited. Obviously, they have power to message and, and to talk and to you know ask pointed questions, but but they have very little power. There's a question of what Susan Collins does and what Jeff Flake does. I mean, you, you, they need two defectors basically to have any hope of doing anything. They could do some things where they try to shut down the entirety of the Senate. That, that can be a sort of rules tit for tat where they would probably get blocked pretty quickly. But even if you believe they could just keep shutting down the Senate, in a world where public opinion was against him, I'm not sure what that would get them in the long run. I think that for Pierre, the lesson for Democrats, and it is one they should learn, is midterms matter. Mm -hmm. Republicans vote more in midterms. Um, people who care about the court vote more in midterms. And in 2014, if Democrats had not stayed home and handed the Senate over to Mitch McConnell, Merrick Garland or whoever more liberal justice Barack Obama had appointed instead of Merrick Garland with a Democratic court would be on the court. And very possibly Donald Trump would not have won in the aftermath of that. So I, I see this sort of – when things like this come up and there's just a power problem, I see that people always want there to be an answer for their side. I saw it with the Republicans um, in the, the Obama era. They, they felt that there must be something the Republicans could do to make Barack Obama do stuff they wanted him to do on the court or elsewhere. But until they had enough power, right, they, they, there wasn't all that much they could do. And Republicans in those cases, after 2010, they always controlled at least one a branch of Congress. So to me, Democrats don't have a lot of good options, but they have a lesson here. Midterms matter, even when you don't think they do. Midterms matter. And if they learn that lesson for 2018, well, then if Ruth Bader Ginsburg leaves the court or something else happens after that, but Democrats control the Senate, they're not going to be in this position again. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I my instinct tells me uh, that every minute you're spending calling Susan Collins or Jeff Flake and hoping that they defect on an issue that is the winningest issue for them, which is the courts, is a, a minute better spent organizing driving folks to the polls for exactly the reason that you said. I just I cannot envision looking at this list of twenty five people and knowing. They're all going to be fine. <laughs> there's nobody, there's no Bork on this list uh, who can be demonized. And so I think energy being spent trying to either shame Mitch McConnell by saying like, wait, what? You're not following your own rule? Like, my God, those are brain cells you're never going to get back. So I think I agree. I think uh, spend it on organizing. And, and then I think also here I am, I guess, a little bit less cynical. I, I do think that part of the disparity here is the story we tell voters about the courts. And I think that Republicans have mastered absolutely the argument that if you care about any of the following seven things, then the court is the pipeline to that. And I think Democrats, you know, <laughs> went to the polls in 2016 with two octogenarians and one 79-year-old, oh, and one vacant seat and didn't think that if they cared about the environment or labor or LGBTQ rights or women's reproductive rights, that the court was a central issue. And I just think that failure to connect the dots. And I think you're right to say because they've been on the winning side of that. And so there's no reason to say, um, you know, you, if you care about X, then you vote on the court. Uh, but I think that if we don't do 
uh, a better job of saying every single thing uh, that matters to you uh, could go away. And in many ways, this term actually did go away when you look at labor, uh, when you look at uh, you know, mandatory arbitration clauses. Uh, it's just been such a tough year. And I think that the failure to signal that that is connected to how you vote has been a sort of decades long weakness. So that's a good segue into my final question. I always ask for book recommendations, but if you're a, a, a if you're somebody who you feel listening to this conversation, you've not paid nearly enough attention to the Supreme Court, you need to understand it better. Are there any good books on the court that you would recommend to people? I think I might suggest that people read a book called uh, One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy. It's by Carol Anderson. And it is, I think, to the extent that we still think that voting is too complicated to understand and we don't fully understand sort of the contours of gerrymandering and how that fits in with the purges of voter rolls and how all that fits in with racial gerrymandering. I, I'm going to suggest one person, no vote, which I think really, really explains this larger question that looms under a lot of what we're talking about today, which is how if you're going to lose demographically, you have to win on voting. And and really, again, in light of the term we just had on voting rights, I think people need to be much better informed about what's happening in the states and how it's happening and what Chris Kobach and his vote fraud commission almost got away with. It is sobering. And I think the reason, Ezra, it's really important to me is that I think folks are losing confidence in voting and some of the well, there's no point in my voting. The whole thing is rigged. Uh, I think that we need to reclaim very, very strongly the idea that there have been all kinds of assaults on voting and we need to understand what they are and how they're happening and work really, really meticulously to reverse engineer that. So that that's my recommendation, I think. That's a great recommendation. I'll also say for folks, um, Carol Anderson was a, a guest on the show a couple months ago. If you go back in the archives, and we talked a lot about voting, so you can get a little bit of a preview there. Um, but Dahlia, uh, thank you so much for joining me. I know this is a very busy week for you, um, and it's incredibly, incredibly clarifying to, to talk with you about it all. It's a pleasure, Ezra. Thanks for all you do. That is the show. Um, <laughs> that's the show. Thank you to Dolly Lithwick for being here and for offering um, such great analysis. Thank you to my producer, Jillian Weinberger. Uh, thank you to you for being here and spending the time with us. Uh, the Ezra Klein Show is a Vox Media Podcast Network production, and we will be back shortly. Shortly.